Uh, later in the evening, we'll be joined by CEO Stephen Pearce and head coach Paul Warren. Uh, but we're going to start tonight by looking to the future. Please welcome Derby County Academy Manager Matt Hale and Derby County Lead Under-21 Coach Jake Buxton. always have to do the fake handshake like we've not already said hello to each other backstage. Um, pick up your mics, gentlemen, please, um, otherwise no one will hear you. Um, just to explain to everyone how this is going to work, uh, we've had plenty of questions sent in in advance tonight. Uh, we'll try and get through all of those and then time allowing, uh, I'll get out on the floor and take some questions from all of you. So please do be thinking of anything uh, you would like to ask Matt or Bucko or Stephen or Paul a little bit later. Um, but to get this started, um, I'll sort of get, a, I guess, a bit of a state of a union a statement from the pair of you, if that's all right. Um, Matt, firstly, um, and I, I should say we had a conversation earlier today for the Academy Review Show, so this might be a little bit repetitive for us, but it's new for everybody else. Um, coming up to the end of your first season here, how would you sort of sum up your time at Derby so far? Um, no, I think, first of all, uh, really enjoyable. It's been a new challenge for me. I was at a previous club for a, for a long time. Um, down near the West Country, as you could probably tell. Um, so, yeah, it's been a new challenge, something I've been, again, I think I said at the beginning of the season, been made to feel very welcome. Uh, the hospitality has been good up north, never been this far in my life. Um, so, no, I've really enjoyed it. Um, I think we've made some good progress in the academy, uh, on and off the pitch. Some really good work going on already and um, more to come, hopefully. So, yeah, really enjoyed it. Yeah, fingers crossed. Bucko, is Bucko okay? It always feels strange calling you Jake. I called everybody by their first name, but me by my nickname, so, yeah, it's good. <laughs> okay, Mr Buxton. Um, <laughs> no stranger to Derby, obviously. A um, couple of different roles at the academy now. 21s these days. How would you sum up the season for your boys? Um, as a team, we've been developed the players excellently so um, the points we've probably gained has not been what we've 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 set out to get up to yet but in terms of performances against some top clubs within the country we've been we've been tremendous um, and individual and the players what we're trying to develop on a day-to-day -day basis is we're seeing some great players from younger ages stepping up to play for for the 21s and producing some some um, yeah, top individual performances. Um, we should say it's a little bit quiet around Moor Farm this week because there are so many of, of the guys that are away on internationals. Um, Jack Thompson and, and Kai Robinson are two names that people will probably know in particular, both away with England. But you're excited for everyone that's away, aren't you? Um, yeah, I think it's an outstanding achievement for, for, for Kai and for, for Jack to, to hopefully represent England. Um, it's been a long time since we've had anybody go away. Um, yeah, for for England, so but we also got a few other boys who are away. Uh, Cruz Allen's away with with Wales, along with Daniel Cox. Um, Nar Macandrew away with um, Republic of Ireland, um, and, and Carlos Richards away with Gibraltar. So um, tremendous amount of players are representing our football club on, on the international scene. And man, it's one of the the markers that you look at, isn't it? International call-ups in terms of the success your players are having. Yeah, I think it's important. I don't think it means everything in terms of what, what you, you know, the standard of player. There's a lot of players, good players, talented lads across the country that aren't picked for their country. But if you, you know, we're trying to aspire to be a Premier League club here, or back to the Premier League, and we've got to produce players that are good enough to, to play at that level. And I think if you go to any Premier League club um, around the country this week, it's pretty quiet. You know, their first team lads, most of them will be international players. So if we can start to produce players that are playing for their country, particularly England in, you know, top 10 FIFA teams, I think then you can say, well, we've got some really top talent in the building and to have lads like Buckos, just Mr. Buxton's just said, um, <laughs> then it shows that, you know, we've got that talent in the building and, um, yeah, somebody's got to go to Morocco on uh, Thursday and watch them play. Tough job. Um, 
Uh, and just before we get to the questions that have been sent in, uh, we don't often get to, to break news in this sort of uh, environment, but there is a bit of news from the Academy involving one of your staff who's moving on that I think you're able to reveal tonight. Yeah. I hope so, having asked that question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we, we brought in uh, somebody called Craig Fleming at the beginning of the season or early on in the, the year. Craig was at Southampton with me uh, a, long, well, a couple of years back. Unfortunately, left. He was on the first team coaching structure uh, with Ralph hassan Hutel and did really well with him in the Premier League. Uh, as you probably know, Ralph got a job with Wolfsburg over the weekend and we kind of knew that you know, Ralph would be coming for, for Flem. Uh, Flem's done a great job for us with, with Bucko and the rest of the what I call professional phase staff in implementing kind of a new or evolved player methodology around the older age groups with the 18s and 21s and and again, they've all done a great job. Flem was really instrumental in that, but unfortunately, if Wolfsburg come along in the German Bundesliga, we had to let him go. So he's done a great job for us. We're going to build on that work. We, we've got uh, more work to come to implement, and we're in a good place to do that. But unfortunately, yeah, it'd be without Flem, who's taking his first session this afternoon in Germany. Obviously, it's a disappointment, but I, I suppose in a similar way, if you lose players to any club and we know that over the last couple of years in different circumstances players have moved on to different academies manchester united manchester city etc but do you take it as a compliment and and the sign of the good work you're doing if staff if players are being looked at by by bigger clubs in that way yeah for sure i mean i think probably losing phlegm to the top german bundesliga you know competition shows the talent we've got on the staff as much as the players um, and no doubt, you know, other, other staff at, at some point will move on, but we'd also like to retain those top staff and top players. Um, so we know we've got some really good, talented individuals in our pathway. And as much as uh, we don't want to lose them, you know, we want to retain them at, at some point. That decision goes to Stephen and David over there if they want to sell them or not, but um, <laughs> no, they don't. So, yeah, we want to retain those top talent, top staff, top players. Uh, let's get to some questions that have been sent in, in advance. We've had a, a handful for the pair of you. Um, <clears throat> no under-18s or under-21s players have featured for the first team for more than 90 minutes this season. Would you have liked them to be given more of an opportunity to impress, especially in the EFL trophy? Who wants to start with that one, gentlemen? Go on, Buckham. Um, I think when you talk about opportunity, I think Dejon, Darren Robinson have trained with the first team from the first day of pre-season. So, them boys have had a great opportunity to fight for the shirt, fight for the opportunity to, to play within the first team. And ultimately, every day they've trained, they've not quite done enough for, for the gaffer to play on, to start on, to give them more game time. So. They've had the opportunity, my job and, and Matt's job is to try and get them down there and train in with the first team every day. And ultimately, if you train well and you're consistently performing in training, your teammates and the staff will put you in if you're performing to that level. On the other side of it, at times, you don't quite know how they're going to do until they play for the first team. So, for example, Liam Thompson was not probably a standout within the 21s, gets an opportunity with the first team and then took his opportunity at that time and, and that's how it works. Um, but to say they've not probably got the opportunity is probably not fair on, on the staff, first team staff, because some boys have been down there training regularly um, and just not took the opportunity. Yeah, I think to echo those sentiments that Bucko's saying, I think also... There's probably two projects going on here. One is that we're trying to get out of this league, you know, and into the championship first and foremost. And those young players have to be good enough to make an impact to, to earn three points or help earn three points for our first team. And, you know, that's a, that's a tough ask for any manager to put them in at the right time because whilst we'd all love to see, I think, a group of 18, 19-year-olds or some of them playing for our first team and get that opportunity... It's got to be at the right time because you can also break that player if it's not the right time. That makes sense. You put them on in a crunch game and it's 2-1 and they make a mistake. 
it's hard to recover. So I think we all want to see young players come through. And I think in the background, we've got a good sort of mid to long term project happening that we'll see that come to fruition soon. But it also has to be the right time for those young lads. And they're all at different stages. We've got lads out on loan in the conference, what I call the Conference Premier National League, getting a good experience. Other lads in our under-21s won't need to go on loan. They'll need to get that experience with our under-21s and potentially train with the first team and go straight in. So I think you've got different routes and different journeys for those lads. So it's not linear, it's not easy. And they have to be ready at the right time. If that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, sort of following on from that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, do either of you expect to see more youngsters involved next season in the first team? If so, which players do you think have the greatest chance of breaking in? And I appreciate, and I'll add this caveat, I, I know sometimes you can be reluctant to talk about individuals, but do you think, Matt, there will be players close next season? Or again, is that really up to the first team staff? Um, it's a collective for the political answer. I think it's not, again, it's not, is the gaffer's choice, obviously, if they're, if they're ready, but we've got a job to do, like Bucko said, to make sure they're ready. Um, yes, I do think there's some top talent within our professional development phase, between 17 and 21. Um, the average age of a Premier League debut is 21. So if you've got 17, 18 year old breaking in, it, Premier League or Championship level at that age, that's unique. So I think we've got to be careful here. 16, 17 isn't the norm to play first team football. The average age is actually 21 for a debut. And if we can get lads in before that age, then that's incredible, incredible achievement. But there is top talent in the football club and people before me and people around me need to take great credit for that. Not me. Boko, anything to add? Um, you can say no and I can ask the next no, question if you want. I think when we get promoted, <laughs> yeah, uh, and the, obviously the bench is, I think I've got this right, nine. Is that right? Sub substitution? Yeah, subs? I'm not looking about no? championship, yeah. I don't want to curse okay. it. Okay, so we're hoping, yeah, that, w that would help. Um, we'd, which would help in the course in terms of trying to identify talent to try and bring to the club as well. So, um, but like I said earlier, we've got some tremendous young boys who are performing well ahead of the years in terms of their age. Our average age for the 21s is, is 17, 18. So we're a young group. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we think we'll have more players in and around it come this time next season. Uh, one more pre-prepared question, which is really a warning to everyone else to, to get thinking of some things. Um, and you've sort of touched on this a little bit already, Matt, with specific plans for specific players. But uh, what improvements does the academy have to implement to ensure that youngsters do get first team experience and not stall their development? I suppose I'm more interested in the development bit of that question, which is how do you plan for individual players? What sort of routes and paths do you think will be put in place for them? Yeah, I think first and foremost, what we've done at the beginning of this season, we, we restructured a little bit of the, again, professional development phase of 17 to 21s. And we have two individual development coaches with Keith Briggs and Lewis Bourne in place who specifically target each and every player within that, those two age groups. And every six weeks, they've got a bespoke training program that they'll practice two, three sessions per week on the areas they need to work on. So again, at every position, every player has a different set of requirements. They're, they've got good strengths, but also areas that our staff have identified, that's what we need to focus on for the next six weeks. So first and foremost, there's a plan in place which looks different for each player. Um, I think secondly, we're working on to allude to what Bucko is saying, opportunities going into next season of how we can get more players, more training time with the first team during the week so that they're making that transition from 18s, 21s football into the first team environment um, easier, smoother, and that the first team staff can have more oversight of at times. I think our games programme this year, we went into the Central League to play senior teams so that, and it's a competition, it's three points so that our young players understand the value of three points. And I've always said that 
winning is important. In fact, winning is probably everything, but not at the expense of development. But our 21s need to understand how to win a football match because the gaffer and the staff want players that can go in and help get three points out there. So we've got a really realistic, um, competitive plan in place in the professional phase that is different to the younger age groups. You know, that those young technicians come up and they're, they're very good technically and they've got some really good behaviours and they're dar they've got a derby culture. But then Bucko needs to, I shouldn't say it, Bucko needs to teach them how to cheat a little bit. Because, <laughs> do you know what I mean? We'll, we'll give you a right to reply in a minute, Bucko. But that's the game. That's the game. We've got to, um, you can edit this anyway, can't you? You've got to know how to bring, bring them down on the halfway line, you know? You've got to know how to just keep the ball in the corner for two or three minutes. And Bucko's good at that. So Bucko's to blame for the couple of late red cards we've seen for the 21s, is he? Um, just on that, though, on the Central League, because that was a bit of a, a big change, how beneficial do you think that has been for, for, the, for the young guys this year? I just think the variety of fixtures for them young boys um, is tremendous. Us playing Man City, Man United, Tottenham. But for them boys to experience um, playing Notts Counties, Mansfield, it's, it's the same with the variety of fixtures in pre-season. He, he's playing the non-league clubs, trying to make sure the lads get exposure to every way of playing um, and, and we try and give them the tools to, to deal with that um, and I think it's been a great success entering that league and we've not done it in the past um, and yeah it's been beneficial for them. Going back to the dark, dark arts of, of trying to foul people and drag people down, that was because I was slow. <laughs> yeah, that was, that's what you was thinking Owen, weren't you, about red cars mate. I wouldn't dream of saying that. Not to your face. Um, right, uh, let's get some questions from the crowd. The plan is for me to try and get round and get the microphone to you. So uh, if we see some hands, uh, I'll get around and ask some questions. Otherwise, I'm going to have to think of more things to say. Are there any hands out there? We'll go, I'll come to the back, but we'll start here at the front, just because it's a little bit closer. Just give us your name and ask your question, sir. Uh, hello, I'm Jim. Um, with what's happened this week again with Reading, can I just give a really big shout out to David Klaus? Can you imagine this club without a training ground and a reserve team and everything else? And they're all about selling their training ground and not being able to train the kids or even the first team. So we're very lucky. Thank you, David. Thank you, Jim. Matt, do you want to... No, I mean, I obviously echo that because David's given me a job. But also... <laughs> Um, I mean, I've been to a lot of training grounds across the country, and, and again, from my time at Southampton, the training ground we've got is twice the size. It's got some incredible facilities. It's up there with some of the best that I've seen in the Premier League. And um, again, we've got to be very thankful for that and a great platform, I think, to build on and help us get to that level. So I agree. Uh, let's see some more hands. We've got our next question here, but I need to know where I'm going next. So does anyone else have questions? See, this is working perfectly because I can just get around the room. Uh, your name, sir, and your question? Oh, sorry. I'm also Jim. Um, <laughs> I'm mainly wondering who decides what style of play academy teams play. Is that, does that come down from first team manager or is it based on each individual manager to decide how players play and what style they play in? I think at this moment in time, which we, we're building, um, it's called the Gamecraft Manual at this moment in time, which is basically a playing philosophy for the old academy, which will run from PDP all the way down to foundation. So every age group will have a part of that Gamecraft, what we, we, we work to. Um, it's a clear way of playing um, and actually working, and it's really, really successful. At the start, I was a little bit, I'm not sure, at the start when, when we'd employed Flem, he was obviously just left us at the time and trying to implement a certain style of play, but more I've worked and done it and worked in it, um, it's going to be a real clear way of playing um, and it's going to benefit the young boys. Um, definitely getting the ball down and playing, free-flowing football with an high energy, high pressing, front line, taking the ball off the opposition, being aggressive. Um, 
So, yeah, you, you'll see, hopefully in time, you'll see an under-21s team playing exactly the same as a under-14s team, which is which would be amazing to see. Matt, anything else to add? Or? Uh, yeah, I mean, I just think there's certain principles of the game that, that don't really change. Whoever's in charge, and certainly there's an element of our job in the academy to teach the principles of football. You know, when to press, when to drop off, and, and some, some real basics. What happens tactically then can change in the first team, but again, our job is whoever the first team manager is, by the time they get to that point, if he's asking them to drop deep or the low block that it is now or anything like that, they've, had, they've got those principles that they can adapt and apply. So adaptability within our players is part of our curriculum, but we've also been embedded again with Flem in Bucko, a really bespoke style of play in the 21s and 18s that we think befits a Premier League club. So if you look at Premier League football now, I think it's domination of the football. You know, they rarely give it away. If they do, they're probably one of the teams lower in the division. And, the, you know, the top teams like Man City, Liverpool and others... As soon as they lose it, they press in big numbers very, very quickly and they get the ball back within three or four passes. So I think it's a pretty good basis to start. If we can get Derby County's teams playing like that, I think that sets us up for, the, for success in the future. Thank you, Jim. Uh, more arms up, please, so I can figure out where we're going. Uh, we'll stay over here for now. Gentleman in the purple. It's lilac, isn't it? It's lilac, I apologise. Go on. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, uh, Jim too has nearly stolen my question. Uh, but I'd like to enlarge a little bit on that and ask both of you, really, but what, if any, input our head coach has on your formations and your tactics? Does he have any input into that, or is it just all you're doing? And just adding something completely different on top of that, I'd like Jake to uh, answer if his winner against Forrest is the highlight of his career. <laughs> Wait, which one do you want to answer first, guys? Yeah, I, I think, firstly, um, the age group I look after, the 21s, is the closest to the first team, so I, I have to have daily conversations uh, with the first team staff. Um, we're on the same page in terms of what we expect from the players. Um, the first team are wanting to press and get after the teams, be aggressive on the front foot, and we're no different. So we're aligned on, on that, which is, which is excellent. Um, when looking at applying for this role, I spoke with the first team to make sure that um, our beliefs and what I think I bring to our academy is in line with what the first team staff want as well. So it's a, it's a good fit on that. Um, anything more to add on that, Matt? Um, no, again, I think, again, the relationship between Bucko and other coaches like Keith Briggs and uh, Ross, even their goalkeeper coach, is really, really close and really tight with the first team. You know, we... We eat together, if you like. You know, it's a big thing. So you're talking informally every morning, every lunchtime around the game. There's informal meetings that, that we all will go to. I meet with the gaffer every Thursday in a kind of football exec team meeting. So the communication and the alignment is growing all the time. But yes, we understand what the gaffer wants. Uh, he'll have a, an impact sometimes on team selection that he needs a player to drop in for game time. So... Bucko will, will work around that and, and obviously really accommodating because that's important that if the gaffer wants to put that lad back on the pitch for 90 minutes and they've been off for five or six games, they need some game time. So, you, you, you know, you, you've got a good working relationship, that's for sure. Oh. There's a good working relationship be between us all um, and we're all behind the gaffer to try and get us out of this league, that's for sure. And on the, the second question, Bucko, career highlight? Um... Probably, yes, at the time, yeah. <laughs> Simple answer. Um, we'll do one more question here, I think, and then I'll head that way. So, what's your name? What's your question? It's not Jim. Uh, <laughs> name's Matt, and we've spoken around patterns of play, but I just wondered what's the 
uh, the vision, the purpose that we see for the academy? And has that changed, Matt, since you took the role? Is that driven from you or is that driven from elsewhere? Um, good question. I mean, we've got what I call academy leadership teams. So there's eight or nine of us that are heads of department. So head of medicine, head of education, um, head of coaching, if you like, all those heads of department. And we spent the last seven or eight months looking at what we've got as an academy performance plan. So an academy performance plan is exactly what we're going to do day in, day out to achieve our objective. And we've reviewed that and as a group, and it's probably not been exposed to every member of staff yet because it's still work in progress. But our objective as an academy is to be Premier League ready. Really simple. And that means that every facet of our academy is Premier League ready. So players, but the environment, the facilities, um, the staffing structure, uh, the technology, the innovation, everything that I th what we all think it takes to get to the Premier League and have a Premier League ready academy is what we're going after. So yes, we're in League One, but we're a Category One academy. We've got a Premier League stadium, we've got Premier League training ground. So the objective of the academy is to be Premier League ready. Simple as that. That's Thank you, Matt. Right, uh, next question. I think there was a hand here. Yes, there was, and we'll keep moving that way. Hi, lads. A uh, question for you both. Um, do you work with any other sports at all? And if so, uh, which sports? And what's the best thing that you've learned from other sports? Nice question, Matt. I'll steal that. Well, st I mean, just uh, last week, we've had somebody come in from the LTA to work with our coaches and do two sort of workshops on momentum. So there's some transferable skills. Okay, tennis is a slightly different sport, but there's some key principles again on momentum and how you regain momentum um, and how not to lose momentum in a game. So only in the last two weeks, we've had some workshops with our coaches and a lead LTA coach. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we don't just work with other sports, but we've got other businesses and organisations, whether it's as a group of staff or as individuals, um, we'll go away. We, you know, a lot of us have got mentors in different businesses again. So I've got a mentor that was CEO of B&Q. So I can learn off him of, you know, different, different aspects. Um, but yeah, we, we do not just sports, but other businesses, other organisations, and probably one of the historical best places I've been was the Yehudi Menuhin School of Music in Cobham, where you just where they take young musicians from around the world at 11 and 12, and they have day release, you know, and they're, and they're learning eight nine hours a day in terms of whichever musician they've got the scholarship for, and the way they live their life to become a top musician was fascinating. I'm not sure we can transfer everything back to Derby, but there are some really key skills that I certainly picked up from that study visit. And again, we've got lots of different staff going away at different times on study visits, but they come back and deliver to the staff on what they've learned and try and pick up on the little bits and pieces that can give us the edge in the a little bit of percentage to get us a bit better. So there's definitely lots going on, yeah. Bucko, not tempted to learn violin or anything, no? <laughs> uh, more questions from the floor. Can we see any more hands? Yes, sir, coming this way. Past the media team. Hello, my name's, hello, my name's Dave. I just wondered how you go about recruitment and also retention of players, academy players. Yeah, so the retention, we, we, the process has been uh, bought in this season. Uh, we're doing audit, which is uh, all departments who work in the academy, who work with the player on a, on a day to day basis, will all sit down. So there'll be psych and social, physical, uh, the analytic department, uh, the physios, and we'll all sit down four times a year and have conversation around the players on, on where we think they should be progressing for, for another contract the next season or, or the reasons why um, we don't think they'll be retained um, so it's an in-depth conversation throughout that process and it eliminates any sort of
problems along the way instead of us probably just sitting down at the end of the season and, and saying yes or no over, over the players. There's, there's a lot more to it. Um, that process has, has, has been brought in this season, which has been very good. Um, it gives a voice to, to all departments who work with the players throughout the season, so it's not just left to the coaches. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, we do have the they have the say. We it, it is open to everybody at that moment in time. Um, and then, in, in terms of the bringing players to the football club, um, we are in the process of building the profiling for the players and, and what we're asking the players to do. Um, and we have head of recruitment, Jamie Smith, within the academy. Uh, they all uh, bring players to, to myself and, uh, and to the academy and, and they'll trial. Um, and then we'll see if they deem fit enough to to be offered a contract or not. Like no, I just think that we've got good coverage as a Category 1 academy across the country. Um, we've got a good level of resource in terms of staff and some really good sort of filtering processes. So. You know, we, we'll have lots of scouts out at weekends, if you like, across the age groups, and there'll be a good filtering process so that they get kind of escalated in, like, Jamie is our head of youth recruitment, will then decide whether or not they come in for a trial. So there's good processes in place. It's a competitive landscape out there now. You know, again, we're really the only Category 1 academy in League 1, um, barring one other but it's really competitive now with those Premier League clubs because every Saturday, Sunday, more farm will be packed with scouts from those clubs. So I think partly due to Brexit, it's, you know, where the best players, it's 16, were potentially coming into England from Europe. It's now not possible. So the territory for all those clubs to fight on is now in England at 14, 15, 16. So it's, it's really competitive and our retention plans, our policies are going to be, I think, really, really crucial because as Bucko said, we've got two lads out with England, we've got others with Ireland, Wales and others that aren't with their international countries this week. But they'll be on the radar of every other club in the country that they've probably got a load of money. So... It's going to be going to be interesting space, and that's why we've got to try and retain them. Just to pick up on the retention thing, I'm over this side now, Matt. Hi. Um, just to pick on the retention thing, because um, I know supporters get frustrated when young players leave, and, and that's happened for different reasons over the last few years. But ultimately, um, you can't force anybody to stay, can you? If a young player decides they want to move on, I know there's some protection in terms of compensation and things like that. So. Can you just explain to us a little bit more about what the offering is to try and keep players at the football club, the younger players? Um, young as in 16, 17, yeah. So I think, I mean, we're working through some, some plans around that, you know, contract length, contract strength. You know, if we, you've got to get the balance right here between giving them too much too soon and keeping them hungry. So whilst you've got to try and compete, in my view, with some of the other clubs that potentially have more money to offer, Premier League clubs, on a contract. I think if we can provide them with opportunity and pathway, that's as strong as X amount of pounds per week. So I think we've got to have a really good structure in place, which we're working on, to be able to be giving players a contract if they're earning that contract at 17, 18, whenever it is. But it doesn't give them the fact they don't need to work any harder, if that makes sense. So it's getting the balance right is going to be crucial that you get the contract level right and you keep them hungry and they can earn as they go and they can, you know, as they get recognised and as their achievements grow, they, they can get a little bit more. But I also think if we can give them the pathway and the opportunity, then this is the place to come. Uh, we've got time for a few more questions. Have we got any more hands coming up? There was one in the middle, but I think it's disappeared. Of course, he will be all the way at the back. Has anyone closer to me got a question? Yes, we'll go. We'll go here first, and then I'll come that way. Madam. This is a very serious question for Jake Buxton. You sit fairly close to me at the match, just in front of me. Oh, he's so scared. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, 
every so week. So yeah. at, at the next match, could you just turn around and wave? <laughs> <laughs> Come and sit with us if you want. Come down and sit with us, yeah? Everyone's going to be asking now. Um, yes, sir. Hello, it's Neil. Um, I'm just curious about the, when you send your young players out on loan, um, what's the process for... Obviously, it's, it's obvious you need to get a good fit, if possible. What is the process? What's the input from you and the, op from, and the other club? Do you go out and watch them? How does it all work? I think, first of all, every loan's a bit different. Um, so we, we know that Dej is out at the moment with Gateshead. Um, he had a lot of interest before that one. We didn't think any of those other interested clubs were the right fit. Take your words, you know. And, and what goes into the loan? Is there a necessary for a re return on investment? Is, there a, is it necessary to get the money back? If he's not starting, should we have a little bit more money because he could have been starting in our 21s. Is it the right style of football? Is it full time? Who's the manager? Um, how long's the loan for? So there's all these different components which, again, everyone's different. So there'll be probably five or six of us involved in that discussion around, is this the right one? Um, there were times when, you know, Dej could have gone before Christmas and liaising with the gaffer and the first team staff, we just felt it wasn't the right one and it could be needed. So there's a lot that goes into each and every one, really. Um, I'm not sure if that answers it, but it's quite a bespoke, quite individualised. I think there's, there's a certain amount I can give him with the 21s, which um, I can only take him so far. So there's so many experiences which Dejan and the other players will get from being out on loan. First team football, being in a proper dressing room, proper environment with supporters, screaming at him, telling him, scoring in front of a proper crowd. I can try and create that environment with the programme we try and put on and the fixtures and the variety of fixtures, but ultimately it's not to the same level. So Dejan going out on loan to Gates said the experience he's going to get from being there is amazing. Of course, we'd love him to be with us out there with our first team. But at this moment in time, he's having a great time, great experience, and it'll set him up for the next stage, and he'll report back in pre-season, and then we'll see where he goes. Um, but, yeah, like what Matt says, each player's different, so each loan's different for each player, and what experience they need to get them into the first team, we'll try and provide them with. Uh, and just to sort of add to that, because um, I spoke to Dave yesterday, it's not as if he goes to Gateshead and never hears from anyone at the football club, is it? I think a member of staff's been to see him in every single fixture he's played for Gateshead, is that right? Yeah, I mean, we've got um, somebody in called Ellis Wilmot who's leading our, what I call, player pathways. So lads that basically, once they are available for loan, or there's a loan, or unfortunately, if we release a player, their pathway is going to be different to just being in the building with the full-time staff. So Ellis kind of looks after all those players that are in that, um, that area, that space of either loan or exit. And Ellis is tasked with making sure we've got staff, coaches going to see them play, um, live video. We've got good data on those lads. So we have a monthly meeting where we'll look at all those loan players. Is this loan working? Is it right? Are they getting the right game time? Are they starting? Are they not? Do we need to call them back? There's also a welfare side to that. Um, so, you know, Dej probably for the first time now, he's got to cook his own meal. You know, he's up in Gateshead now washing his pants and all sorts of things. <laughs> so we, we've got a welfare side of this to make sure he's getting the right life skills and the right life care as well. So I think there's plenty of contact. Yeah, staff have been up to watch him. Um, I, I think it's it's important that what's right for the player. So we can all say what's. I'd love Dejan in the 21 scoring goals and winning more games. But what's right for for the lad, and what's right for all the lads who are out on loan. So I think that's important. We, we try and look at each individual, how we're going to get him a career in the game, um, and if that's the right fit for. For that player, we, we make it happen. We've got time for one or two more questions. I'm hoping there was one round here somewhere. 
Thank goodness for that. Hi. Yeah, my name's Jamie. I just wondered how the uh, compensation works, where obviously you develop players and sometimes you're going to have players who come into academy who's going to move on to bigger clubs like we've already had. I just wondered that when the club um, develops these players, does this development then stay with the player and does the club get compensated throughout their career? And does that stay with them? Does the club still get compensated? Like, you know, the guy went to Villa, the guys went to Liverpool, Man United. Do Derby then still get compensated throughout his career? Yeah, again, I think it's really individual and on a bespoke basis. So the ones I've been involved with since I've been in the club, well, one or two, they're, they're slightly different. There's compensation up front. And then there are certain triggers which can be triggered, as in when that young player develops, either plays in the first team or an international, um, there can be a sell-on without disclosing those details. They're, they're different. And my experience at previous club, where we did sell quite a few players, um, each deal was different. So there might be a bigger sell-on um, and less up front. You know, and, and again, it's gauging whether or not you think that young player is actually going to play at the highest level of the game if, if, and be sold and try and get more on a sell-on. But if you don't think they are, you'd probably take as much money as you could up front if they're going to leave. Forget the sell-on. But it's, everyone's a little bit different. Every case is different. But I'm sure... Paris to be have done some really good deals and we'll, you know, we'll get a few quid in, be all right. I think we've got time to squeeze in one more question. If we have one, uh, would anyone like to ask one final question? If not, we can leave it there. One more hand has gone up. It means I've got to walk quite a long way now. I'll get there as quick as I can. Hi, the name's Mark. Uh, all I want to know is, do you set out a successful target at the start of the season? For example, you expect, say, three players from the under-21s to make at least the subs bench of the first team by the end of the season. Do you set out any targets like that at the start of the season? So what we've, again, been working on in the background with this academy performance plan to be Premier League ready is a set of markers that... I think in order to produce players at that level, we should be taking a percentage through from under 16 to be scholars. There's a percentage through from under 18 to become professional players. There should be a number of internationals within that. There should be an asset return in that. So all of our players, particularly in the professional phase, are probably worth something. But in order to get a return on investment in the academy, they need to be worth a lot more. So I, I guess I can't go through the details, but by the end of this season, my brief has been to present to the board what those metrics are. So how many players should be coming through, how many internationals, how many loans that can develop them as an asset, or how much money we can get on a return on investment. So yes is the answer, but I haven't finished it yet. <laughs> Uh, my return to the stage will uh, indicate that that is at uh, the end of the first half uh, of the evening. Thank you for all the questions. And uh, more importantly, thank you to Matt and to Mr Buxton for answering them so well. Uh, let's hear it for our guys. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, no surprises to who my next guests are. Uh, please welcome uh, club CEO Stephen Pearce and head coach Paul Warren. Uh, thanks. So just, just before we start, I just wanted to say uh, we've got uh, Jim and Rachel here this evening, um, who sadly lost Angie. Um, a couple of weeks ago and just wanted to say from the football club sending you all our love and you know that we're always there for you. Here, here. Um, gents, um, you've timed this pretty well, I think, given the result at the weekend. Um, 
Uh, but we're here to look big picture. Um, we've got plenty of questions uh, for both of you. Uh, and I want to get out on the floor as well, uh, as much as possible. Um, so we'll try and rattle through things. Uh, but I wanted to kick off, as we did with uh, Matt and Mr. Buxton, with a sort of State of the Union from uh, uh, the each of you. Um, Paul, could you just sort of sum up uh, where you think we're at on the pitch at the moment? Uh, yeah, no, in a pretty good place. Um, I've been saying all season it's about trying to get to the... I apologise for my voice, I've got horrendous cold. Um, I've been saying all season about trying to get to the two-point average. Um, I know it's hard being a football fan, but it's not easy being a football manager. But, um, like, not to get too downhearted when you lose a game. Teams are always going to lose games, drop points and all that. And you just got to keep trying to be consistent with the lads, which we have. And we've put ourselves in a really good position with seven games to go. So, pretty pleased. Um, as always, with everyone in football, you're never 100% happy, but... Um, no, we've put ourselves in a good position with a good chance with a run-in. So uh, our waveform's been really good as well. So that's really pleasing. So, and they put the lamps on the pitch so the grass might grow back. So that's a good sign. <laughs> so all in all, yeah, really pleased with where we're at. Uh, but, you know, we'll be judged at the end of the season, really. Yeah, big, uh, big seven games to come. And, and Stephen, obviously we have the accounts for last season released recently. Um, can you just sort of, that's a big question, but sum up where we are off the pitch at the moment? Well, I think obviously uh, everybody in the audience will have, will have seen the accounts. I, I think when you look at the, the operating loss that, that was in there at sort of, uh, over 10 million, um, obviously for a League One club, that is um, still a, a substantial loss. So again, thank you very much to, to, to David for, for backing that. I think people need to understand the size of the operation that we've got here at Derby County. Matt alluded to it before in terms of the, the facilities at the training ground, first team and academy, you know, 17 pitches, so unbelievable facilities. Um, and David's commitment, which he said on day one to, to category one academy as well, is, is obviously not, not cheap in League One. Um, so look, we're in a, we're in a healthy position, um, debt free, and in terms of moving forwards, as I'd said previously in my interview with, with Radio Derby and what David had said, from day one in his open letter, you know, this, this football club we want to make sure is running a, in a sensible and sustainable way, but we want to make progress as well. Um, and we're committed to doing that and we'll do that in a, in a financially sustainable way. Uh, lots of questions for you both. Um, is it about my 12 million pound wages, is it? <laughs> uh, that comes up a little bit later. Um, one thing we didn't have a question on, but it's something that's come up in the last 24 hours, Stephen. Um, the Football Governance Bill um, finally arrived in Parliament, hopefully the first step toward an independent regulator. Um, I just wanted the, the club's reaction to that and what sort of you hope that will lead to. So I, th I think as a club, it's something that we support. Um, and it's something that, that David has said in terms of his support for it as well. Um, the FA have come out and, and backed it. Um, the EFL obviously ha ha have done the same. Um, the way that we look at it is, you know, look, as a league-wide, and when we say league-wide, EFL-wide, it's probably got virtually unanimous support, maybe other than some of the, the, the parachute clubs. Um, can't comment for the Premier League, but I think in terms of the, um, the news that's come out today about the, the government bill and supporting that, it's something that we believe is definitely needed. Um, it will make sure that there is interventions, if interventions need to be had, um, to make sure that football clubs are running a proper manner in terms of making sure that they're not run recklessly, and also to make sure that I think that, that the, the way that the broadcasting rights and the distributions amongst the pyramid uh, are distributed more evenly and if football can't sort it out itself that does have the backstop powers to do that um, but hopefully we won't need to go down that route and football will be able to sort itself but fully supportive of it uh, as i say we've got lots of questions that have come in in advance so i'm going to rattle through those before we get out onto the floor um paul what was your favorite fixture since you've taken over I mean, in fairness, I don't know if anyone listens to my interviews. I, I, I find it hard to remember what I did this morning, let alone um, 
Uh, my favourite one this year uh, was on our motivational video, what Ange at the back of the room kindly done. If at the end of the season we could put it out for everyone to see, it's something else. But um, I think it was Oxford. Because uh, obviously we went 2-0 down because Magoli had a, a crazy few minutes. Um, and the lads just kept to the game plan. You know, we kept them tranquilly. Scored just before half time, but then for uh, Cash, but then even more so for Tomo to score the winner was something pretty amazing. So, I mean, someone could easily in the room say, but what about that game, that game, that game? And I'd be like, oh, yeah, I forgot about them. But that one, because it's more prevalent in my memory because I saw the video last week. So I think that one. Uh, Stephen, um, and this sort of encapsulates a few questions that, we, that have been sent in. Um, what's the financial plan and budget for next season? <laughs> they're, they're, they Stephen's are. are a lot more serious than yours, Paul, okay. I have to say. Uh, look, at the moment, as we tend to do, is you have to plan for multiple scenarios. We know which scenario we want to pay off, um, and we're happily planning for that, but essentially... We're still in the process of pulling all of those together. Um, going back to what I said earlier, he's looking at me now, he's going, what's a wage bill? Um, I'm just waiting for the number. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to get it tonight. Um, all I'd say is, from, from the perspective of the football club, look, whatever division we're in, and hopefully it, it is successful, but we don't just want to be there to make up the numbers. We definitely don't. However... <laughs> we're not going to make any reckless financial decisions. So we don't want to be there to make up the numbers. We want to compete, and we will make sure that there is a competitive wage bill and squad to be able to do that. There's a lot of hard work to do, um, but I think it's something that we're planning for at the moment. Would you like a serious question? Because I've not got one. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't want anything serious. <laughs> I'm not good at these events. I'm way too off piste. Uh, when you were playing at your best, Paul, would you have gotten into this Derby team? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Is that my serious one or my... Um... Yeah, comfortably, I think. Um, only because I know the manager really likes athletic players um, and even uh, pre-hair loss um, I could run around. So I would get in this team. I think I would be, um, in fairness to my ability, I would be great in this team in League One. There's no dispute in that. My championship years were... Um, <laughs> I, I must have held a manager hostage. I shouldn't really have played in the championship. But League One, I was OK. But I would have, been, I would have loved the, um, the system that we did have with the 5-2-3. That was a dream for me. So I used to play that with Alan Lee, no one will know in the room. And Mark Robbins, everyone will know in the room. So that was perfect for me. So I'd probably sneak in. And because I kept myself fit, which I can't say is true about all my players, um, I think I'd give myself enough opportunities to impress. So I think I'd get in. Uh, yeah, I think I would. I mean, I've, I've had a lot of cough sweets, so I think it might have affected my thinking. And you might I not pass a drugs test at the moment. If you asked me this tomorrow, I'd say absolutely no chance. But seeing as I'm high on cough sweets, my answer is yes. Stephen, um, this is a bit of a long one. Um, he wouldn't get in me. if that's the... Uh... <laughs> uh, as we know, clubs need to generate more income in order to invest and make the club sustainable for the long term. Clubs need to look away from the pitch and be more creative with their stadiums, property and assets. Now we have a commercial property expert as an owner. Can the club confirm what, if any, plans the club are looking into to generate income from other sources other than match day? Areas such as creating more retail space, that would generate rental income. I've nearly finished. Uh, more advertising space, a pride plaza rather than the current fan park marquee, and or stadium rights. I've finished. Wow. Good job they didn't ask you that because you won't remember the question. <laughs> Not long. <laughs> um, look, we're always looking to generate additional income. I, I think, if we're honest, we've been focusing on all the matters for the last 18 months to get everything rebuilt. Uh, I can't comment for other retail areas around the stadium or potential of that because that would be a, you know, a, a Klaus development. So if that's what they wanted to do as a business, it'd be outside of the football club. But certainly, in terms of us wanting to get back to using the stadium for other things, maybe during the closed season, you know, we had the boxing event um, that sadly got cancelled due to one of the boxers being injured. So we do want to use it for other things, and we are looking at ways and means of doing that in the future. So. 
the simple answer is absolutely yes, we are, and we'd love to do that. Serious question or joke question? Which one do you want? I don't want one of his questions. Se serious. I'll do a, Give serious, him a serious one. Oh, okay, good. Uh, Paul, we appear to be playing with a similar shape to the start Ooh. of the season. Yeah. Albeit with the players having slightly different roles and we're now getting the best out of them. Is the plan for the summer window to recruit players to slot in seamlessly for the current shape? Um, that is always the plan, in fairness. I'm trying to be straight here. You do recruit for a system that you like, but there has to be flexibility in your signing. So there's flexibility with, um, uh, with Callum, there's flexibility with uh, Wardy, with Kane who, uh, if I don't play him, my son gets grumpy with me. My, my son's 20, but my son loves him. Um, so we try and sign players, really, that can play in more than one position, so you have that flexibility. But we do try and recruit to a system that is, that is true. However, you, you know, what's the saying for, like, you're insane if you try and do the same thing and expect a different result? So if we're not winning with a certain system and we see, uh, you know, we need to change it. In fairness, in League One and the Championship, I know you lot have seen more Championship football than League One here for many a year, but the Championship, um, weirdly, is easier to manage in. Most teams play a similar sort of way. All the play is... Uh, coached and rotations and everything like that. League One isn't like that, as you've seen. You could come up here next week and see us play against Carlisle and it could look like a completely different sport to playing against Peterborough. So within your squad, you have to have the ability to be able to manoeuvre, to be able to respect the opposition, but not to overcook it. But you have to have the flexibility in the squad to play different ways. If we were, uh, touch wood, fortunate enough to go up, um, you could be a bit more firm on your beliefs, I think. Thank you, Paul. I mean, that was a long, straight answer. I've done well, didn't I? Thank you. There's, there's a joke question coming up for oh, you. Oh, yes. Back. Um, <clears throat> Stephen, uh, why did the football club allow stories and communications to be let out at the start of the season, stating and giving the impression that they were no longer under transfer restrictions when they clearly were? Do the club believe this put additional pressure and expectation on Paul Warren? Said my mum. <laughs> So I don't need to answer that now, do yeah. I? Thank you, Jenny. <laughs> well, my answer was going to be, I don't think we did. Um, no, genuinely. So I, I think, look, in terms of reports that were out there, we weren't under restrictions. Um, I think the EFL even confirmed that. Uh, and I, I, hopefully, again, I, I explained when I, when I spoke to, to, to Dar at Radio Derby, um, the only restrictions that we were under was the business plan that we created ourselves that we put forward to the EFL for approval. So I think probably where they're coming to is the bit around the January window when we said we could only do loans, but that was essentially because we'd already spent where we got to in terms of wages and we didn't sell players like Aaron Cashin because we wanted to keep him um, and wanted to back the squad and David wanted to back the football club in terms of the best chances of promotion and keeping our talent, which is exactly the conversation that Matt was having earlier about not <coughs> wanting to sell our best talent, whether it's first team or academy. So it, it, it was a, a budgetary thing um, that, that we put ourselves um, and we just wanted to operate within that, which is back to that whole, if we say we want to set a budget and operate within it, that's what we're going to do moving forward. So I... I Sorry to disagree with you, Mum Paul, but uh, yeah, genuinely, I don't think we did. Uh, next question. Uh, will Paul Warren start the bounce if we get promoted? <laughs> well, if we get promoted, yeah. I mean, obviously. You I mean, will, I, I was will. nearly tempted at the weekend, but I, I got... Because um, in fairness, I got Collo's boy, didn't I, yeah. Uh, he was in the team meeting today, Carlo's son. Not in the meeting, but the video of him doing it in, was in the team meeting. But, um, uh, and if you were one of the fans who came at the weekend and you stayed, thank you very much. I, I've, I've never witnessed... Uh, the atmosphere was unbelievable, and, and we've obviously had the uh, comedy element of the flags, which was pretty amazing. It felt like a... Uh, it's the best I've ever been in as a player or as a manager apart from Wembley so thank you for that but I like the fact that at the end no one left or if you did leave then shame on you I know the traffic's horrific though isn't it so there's no point you either go 10 minutes before the end or you might as well just sit it out really so I was more tempted to be involved with the lads then but um but I, but I, I, won't, I won't do it so uh, I'll wait I'll wait until something really exciting I mean winning a home game isn't that worth a bounce for me 
It's, I mean, that happens all the time, doesn't it? it always, if you do it every... It becomes a bit dull, doesn't it? You've you got to leave the special things for the special moments, in, in my eyes. You've always got to have a level to go to. Yeah, exactly. if I do the bounce now, what have I got to look forward to? Promotion, like, oh, another one. Like, <laughs> at, least if I, at least if I do it and there's a bounce, it makes it feel a bit unique, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? I, I, I'll look forward to the bounce. I'll look forward to the bounce. I'll, I'll try and find a, a more light-hearted question for you, Stephen, I promise. Um, but for now... Uh, it's not going to happen, is the it? The recent accounts indicated uh, £10 million is being spent on off-field wages. What sort of proportion of that is being spent on the academy? Uh, does the panel still believe that that's value for money, given the way that young players have been poached for relative pennies in the past few years? I'm now getting the evils from Matt and Mr Buxton at the back as well. They've spent £8 million of it. I was going to say, it's... And to not break it down the ways, I think the easiest thing to talk about, and I mentioned it earlier, a, a category on academy is, is not cheap in League One. You know, I think I've been quoted in the past, it probably costs around £4 million a year to, to run a category on academy. But said that, that is a conscious deci decision that, that David said on day one, he is committed to category on academy and that's what we want to do. And it genuinely doesn't affect the budgeting that we're trying to do for, for Paul, despite what his mum thinks. Um, so we, ge we, we genuinely do want to commit to Category 1 Academy, uh, and we will do moving forwards. And that's why, as I said earlier, the, 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 sort of the operational costs and the facilities costs with all the pitches that we've got. I mean, I guess the size of the Academy, there's only three pitches that are essentially first team at the Academy out of, out of 17. So that shows the size of the operation. Then they have China, and we have them paper cups. <laughs> We sit on Ikea desks and they've got these oak, beautiful ones. There's a, there's a massive... Di they know. Look at them laughing. They know. They're looking very nervous, aren't they? They, they know the truth. But to, and on the talent side of things, I know Matt touched on it. It is a rebuild, um, but we've got some exciting talent coming through, as they've said, at those younger age groups. And I think in the next year or two, um, we should see the fruits of that moving forwards and we will continue to invest at, at the lower age groups as well because one thing they probably didn't touch on but i know we've said before the the compensation side for academy players once you get to that 16 17 is just crazy you know the more expensive than buying players for the first team and i've said that previously so you've got to do it at the younger age groups which takes time to come through um, and we don't want to be that selling club uh, Paul, will there be any contract renewals uh, in your squad before the end of the season? No. <laughs> uh, perfect. Um, that's the shortest answer you've ever given me. Focus on the running, I think, is probably um, what he's trying Just for that, you can get another question. Um, which area do you think we can improve on the most? Don't call that. Don't call that. Uh, all of them, really. Um, and in fairness, I mean that throughout, throughout the club. We need to improve on um, everything behind the scenes. As always, you've got to keep moving forward. Uh, we have to get... Um, whichever league we're in, if we are unsuccessful, then fundamentally, and I include myself in this group, uh, we haven't uh, achieved what we, we set out to achieve, so things need to change. And if we go up, then obviously there is significant... Um, player changes, I think it's fair to say. I think we need to, uh, I, I mean, I've, this is on the record in as many different ways, apart from me having a tattoo across my face. I just think we need more athleticism in the team. We have the oldest squad in the league. Um, so I'm not saying you can't have, you can't carry some experienced players. I don't really want to call them old, but you just need youth and athleticism. So I think um, throughout the team, not being position specific, I just think we need to sign players that are going to be here for three or four years at a good age. You know, you're signing 22, 23-year-olds. I know you could argue that the academy are going to push them through as well, but that's going to take a bit of time. So I'd like to think that we would be able to um, improve the, the playing squad throughout with uh, that sort of category of player that will come in uh, to play, obviously, but to improve and to improve the team. And if they end up moving on for a few years' time, then, you know, good luck to them. They've done a good job for us. They've been great for us. And if we don't get to where we want to go, but their career's taken, they're great. So, yes, yeah, so I just think we need to improve, like, throughout. Uh, we're making good progress here, so I'm optimistic we'll be able to get out uh, and get some questions. Because we started before. early, isn't it? 
I could sense the room. We, we could start early, couldn't we? Eight o'clock. Just the excitement. There wasn't many it. drinkers in here on midweek, midweek. Um, Stephen, can the club set out its football strategy in terms of how it will deliver success, i.e. what are the core principles, focus areas, culture? Who decides this without the director of football employed? Uh, how does it ensure that everyone across the football departments are aligned to the vision? Um, we've, do, we've done a lot of work in terms of, of how we want to set up and how we want to, to run the business and I think Paul's talked about it a number of times and we have and I think first of all it, it comes down to people um, and the cultural side of things and that's why you see all of the work that's been done around the values and, and how we want to, to live and breathe which I think I've said previously has had input from staff as in input from the players um, and I think from certain focus groups as well it's something that's been going on for a number of years um, so that that's the sort of bedrock of it in terms of the strategy and the decision making there's no one person that makes that single decision we want to do it as a collective and a, you know we fundamentally believe that a director of football which you know in my our humble opinion is essentially sometimes if you get it wrong can be somebody that has all the power but not really a lot of the responsibility so we want to make sure that as a collective and we talk about as the football executive that Matt, Matt talked about earlier as long as we're all completely aligned we know what we want to do on the player profile and we want to know about the strategy of how we want to play how we want to develop players how we want to develop players in the first team what success looks like that's an ever-moving piece I think is right Paul you'd say you know the squad will be in transition it has been in transition um, we will back the coaching staff and Paul moving forwards but as I say we won't be doing that in a reckless way but we'll do it a way to keep progressing and to compete in whatever division we're in um, so you're never going to get one person standing up going I've signed this player or this is why we've done that because it is it is a collective and you know we'd never do it without if fundamentally Paul didn't want to do something then clearly we wouldn't because that wouldn't be the collective d decision but it has to be that everybody's bought in there isn't one person's agenda or there isn't one person's you know wanting to succeed we've got to do it as a club and that's the same in every department to be fair as well uh, one final question from me uh, before I head out uh, into the crowd. Paul, um, this came in in a few different guises. Um, Ebu Adams has been it outstanding on the oh. pitch uh, and seems like a popular figure with the staff and players. Uh, it seems like he loves being at the club. Is it realistic that we'll be able to sign him in the summer, whatever league we're in? Uh, yeah, he's done, first and foremost, he's done excellent. Uh, think the world of Eves. Um, so in answer to the second part, and this sounds a really football manager answer, which isn't really like me, but he's Cardiff's player. He's, they've kindly loaned him to us. You know, he wasn't in their plans for this period of time. It doesn't mean he won't be on, in their plans for the next period of time. And um, I suppose you could argue that he's still got potentially seven, oof, I hate to say it, ten games to uh, keep trying to impress us and you know he's got an opportunity to try and win something here but fundamentally he's Cardiff's player so um, it's probably l less likely than more likely. Uh, right time to head out into the floor uh, hopefully people have questions. Yes. Let's see some hands. There can't be any of them long Stephen questions they are long. G them. Jim caught my eye first so we'll start this way and we'll go this way both Jims have got their hands up again. Hello again. Um... The away support is absolutely magnificent. We go everywhere and always are, but wherever we go, we are, the, they, we are their big game. What we saw on the weekend was Derby County becoming... Pride Park was our big game as well. We, we had a black and white day. It is so important. We have seven cup finals. What can the club do to make that every game this season? So uh, I, I think for the home games, so hopefully people will have seen um, the work that we did um, over the last week or so leading up to the, to the Bolton game. I think it's really difficult for us to go out 
and sort of just request and say to fans, come on, you've got to get behind us because you've got to be really careful in terms of how you, how you sort of phrase that and how you go about it. But I think the players got behind it last week. I know that you had obviously spoken as well because the fans, as you said, are already amazing um, and the support that we've been given is amazing. We did some work with, um, with Nick Webster last week in terms of making sure that the flags um, were in the, in the south stand and elsewhere around the stadium to try and create that atmosphere. Um, we're trying to look in terms of what we do on the build-up again um, in, in terms of creating that atmosphere. But I think hopefully the support that we've had so far throughout the season, the support we had especially on Saturday, I'd imagine that will stick with us for the rest of the season now. And Paul, I don't know from your perspective, it was it was a yeah. special sight to see on Saturday. It really was. Yeah, it was amazing. I mean, I loved it, obviously. And I even said to Rich, and if you uh, know Rich, he's like one less grumpier than me or more grumpier than me. So I said to him before the game, look, if nothing else, mate, just enjoy it today because the atmosphere is electric. And it's the first time we've ever, me and Rich, stayed on the pitch at the end and watched the lads clap the fans and all that. It did feel magical. I mean, I've just got two things on that. You're right, the away fans are an absolute joke as well, which is brilliant. Um, and I, I didn't know it was a black and white day. Uh, I didn't, not that I need to get told. I get told everything. It's just, <laughs> my brain can't take he too did, much. He did, he's in. just forgot. Yeah, I did, to be fair. But I, I mean, I buzzed off the flags and it felt like a Champions League game to me, which I loved. And that's why people want to be part of football, to play in great games like that. Just two things for me, really. One was... Uh, and you're going to get offended by this, but I'm brave enough to say it in a room because I know where the fire exits are. Um, I think it helps when the opposition are loud because I think if there's 28, 29,000 Derby fans and respectfully 500 fans from the opposition, I think it's easy for a football fan, and I include myself in this, to turn up and think, oh, this will be all right today, we'll be all right today. You, you won't be all right today. You need, you need, we don't need, but you want the fans to be right behind you. So I think the fact that Bolton started singing at their players and then we started singing and it just felt like a proper football match because both sets, of, I, they were both brilliant fans. I thought it was brilliant. Two real big clubs going a hammer and tong. However, sometimes it's hard to replicate that on a Tuesday night if someone from down south brings 85 fans. That, that, that's my honest thing. I mean, we can try and do as many things, but my other point is, which is my more relevant point, is what would you lot want us to do? Like, would you want the fan, would you want the players to be more engaging with the fans before the game? I don't know, in some way, clap the fans, or is there something that you think, look, I would like to see that? Because if there is, tell me and I'll get the lads to do it. Apart from doing like, you know, naked streaking or handstands, if you, and I mean it with all sincerity. If someone in the room goes, look, I'll tell you what I think is really good. I've seen Man City do this, or I've seen so-and-so do this, and it really engages the fans and get them up. So I watched, uh, in fairness, it was in a uh, momentum... What, what was that meeting we had? Momentum. Momentum, thanks, mate. We had a momentum meeting and uh, last week, a um, uh, CPD event thing. And they were talking, uh, the academy were talking about how they showed the kids the PSG Newcastle game and that uh, the winger for Newcastle in the first minute pressed and then sort of went like that to the crowd and all the Newcastle fans got behind him. I don't know if you saw that game, they won 4-0. So I then showed it in a team meeting and sent it to Nat saying, look, mate, I need you to be amazing tomorrow, but look, do me a favour, I need you to engage with the crowd. And no, I don't know anyone would have seen this, but they took the centre, they knocked it to the fullback, Nat came running over, smashed the fullback, and uh, so I can get What I mean is, like, I, I'm... You could say something to me in Tesco's uh, and I would, you could say, let's sign this lad from Accrington Stanley. And I'd go, oh, I'll take that back. There's nothing you couldn't tell me that I wouldn't listen to, if that makes sense. So, like, I took that off uh, the academy and it sort of, I'm not saying that made the fans sing. I'm just saying that if there's any ideas you have, you can tell us because we don't have all the answers, quite obviously. So if anyone says, you know, I'd really like the fans to do this or do that or I'd really like a, a compulsory, you have to turn up in black and white next game or... I don't know. You have to change the music to ACDC, Back in Black. I don't know. It's just please suggest cause, or email the club because anything that will help engage and you think will help engage the fans will help the players that obviously helps everyone. Uh, we've got 10 minutes, so I'm going to try and get around as many people as possible. Uh, do get your hands up whenever I'm speaking so I can figure out where I'm going next. Uh, we're going to start here, sir. 
I am. Uh, sorry to change the momentum. Uh, Mr. Pearce. Excellent. Uh, what lessons have you learned from the club going into administration? And what responsibility do you take for that event, please? Uh, look, I, I think in terms of the lessons from administration, I, I, I've talked previously, look, I cannot and will not go completely over old ground in terms of that. However, from a perspective of having to run the football club on a day-to-day -day to keep this, you know, this club going with all of the staff, without all of those staff, we wouldn't have been able to get through. And I've said it before, you know, on record, it was the staff and it was us that were, were operationally, day-to-day, -day running this football club. I think I've also said about the fragility of football finances, um, and I mentioned that when I did my interview with Radio Derby, you know, that is the whole reason why this government bill is coming in and why it's backed, because for whatever reason, for whatever football club, whether it's Derby County or whether it's Reading or whether it's Wigan or whether it's, you know, potentially anybody in the Premier League, um, if an owner or a group of owners decides or they cannot fund a football club, you know, I've even heard Rick Parry on the radio today a couple of times in Sky Sports News as well. If they decide they cannot do it, a football club will not be able to continue for very long at all because the reliance on benefactors is the way that that, that football club is run. Um, so I think the lessons learned are that if you rely on a benefactor, that is the risk that you've got to take and that is for almost every football club. Um, in terms of moving forwards with the football club, I think the fact of, you know, from myself personally, we've gone through an administration working uh, for, for the administrators. We've gone through um, a change of ownership in terms of with, with David Clowes. And we always said it wasn't about words, it was about actions. And I think hopefully what you can see from where this club has come in the last 18 months or just over is pretty phenomenal. And again, it is the same group of, of staff that have built this club to where it is and brought it through those dark times as well and stuck with it. Uh, next question over here, and then we're going to go there, and then I'll try and head back to the front. Uh, I'm Jim too again. Um, I was going to ask a question about atmosphere, but it's sort of been covered. But the only thing I'd be curious about is, is there anything the playing staff uh, want to see the fans do? So either more displays, like you said, more flags. Um, is there anything they've seen at other clubs that you think could work well here? I also have a second question, which is ridiculous, and comes from the League of Gentle Folk WhatsApp group, which is, your opinion on beans on a fried breakfast, do they come in a ramekin or an Alan Partridge-style breakwater sausage system? I, uh, obviously, in importance, I'll answer the second one first. Uh, I, I like them in their own little sort of... Uh, I had, I, it's my daughter's 18th today, by the way. So, I know, I mean, I'm not going to be allowed to get back into the house because my wife wanted to shoot me when she knew I was doing this. So, um, but I took him out for breakfast, my mum, my, my wife and my daughter, and I had a, uh, like I like to call it, a trucker's breakfast. But I kept my beans, the beans were served in a separate little, like, not like sort of saucepan, and I like that. I don't want my bean juice mixing. So that, that's your first. This, the first. The first question was about the fans. In fairness, the fans, um, the lads buzz off the fans, uh, especially away from home. But this is unique. In, this is every football club in the world, by the way. All the away fans are closer together. Uh, maybe had a bit more alcohol. I don't know. Um, and are always raucous. Uh, at home, I think the lads, and and I can say this because I feel it at times that. When the team aren't doing good is when you need the fans to try and sing. 
And when it gets edgy and it's silent, it is like tenfold edgy. So, and I know you know this, and, and, and I, like even myself, I'm standing there thinking, I'm going to have to shout at them because everyone's gone into this. Oh my God, please don't concede. Please don't concede. It's only a one goal lead. Oh my God, seven minutes. Oh my. Uh. So I do get it. But I think then, if, if the crowd uh, <laughs> sing and cheer and applaud every little thing, it makes, it's monumental, honestly. So, for example, when a ball got crossed near the end of the game, uh, uh, Saturday, sorry, um, Nelson headed it, and it was like a massive roar. Waggy booted it. Any other time of the season would have got booed, and someone would have told me to get him off. But this, this day, because of the occasion and because of the game and the intensity, was, oh, that's brilliant, Waggy. Good old Waggy, booted it. <laughs> And then, obviously, when Kane Wilson's running, I could hear everyone chattering, going, oh, Kane's got it, we're safe, we're safe, we're safe. So I think it's more about the fans. Uh, the, uh, the flags and that make it feel like, literally felt like a cup final. So I would definitely go down the flag route, and I've said loads of times, love a flag. Um, so I would definitely go down the flag route. And if you could, even if the lads are driving you insane because they're underperforming, they don't intend to underperform, obviously, but if anything good happens within that, or they just defend well, if you could try and get behind it, it would be great. And I've said this for ages and ages, and loads of football fans hate it when I say this. You are, and other managers disagree with me when I have this conversation, you are 100% entitled to boo the team off when the final whistle goes if you weren't happy with what you saw, right? That's what I think, right? Because you've paid your money. If you think the lads haven't tried, you're entitled to give them stick. The lads won't like me saying this, but this is what I think. However, the caveat to that is during the game giving them stick, has no positive benefit to a performance at all. So if you sit there and go, rubbish, he's rubbish, rubbish, boo, I hate Wilson, boo, get Wilson off. He isn't suddenly going to turn into Ronaldo because you booed him. So my thing is, if I could and I could get into every football fan of our club, I would say, look, just stay positive with the lads as long as you can, you'll get more out of them. If you're not happy at the final whistle, then by all means tell them and they know. But... People who are positive around positive, and these are good kids, by the way. We sign really good players here, really good men. I know what good men they are. Uh, because, in fairness, they've done a thing today with the uh, uh, PFA, and the PFA man's emailed me to say, look, this is the best group of players he's ever met. They're really good people, and they respond to really good, positive people. So my honest, very long answer is definitely put the beans in a pan. And um, <laughs> just try and be as kind and generous as you can, because I think you get it back. That's what I honestly think. And I know that sounds naive. Correct answer on the beans. Uh, next question here. So we've seen like Fan Hub recently on... So Warren's been wearing the Fan Hub beanie and then it's been on the uh, training kit and everything. So I was wondering if it would potentially be a sponsor for next season, like on the kit. Yes, um, most definitely. So I think next year... Um, regardless of divisional status, um, they will be a, uh, a sponsor on the kit for next season. Down at the front? The bobble hat passed the test. <laughs> Prior to that, we weren't sure, but I didn't mind the bobble You're hat. You're not taking so. it off. I liked it. I don't know why. I just, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit quirky. Next question. First of all, I'd just like to thank David for saving Derby County. Secondly, Paul, happy Christmas. Happy Easter, mate. Happy yeah. Easter. <laughs> and then my question to you, Paul, is yeah. we've had a lot of managers here that when we have free kicks and corners... Oh, good question already. Always, yeah. they always bring everybody back to defend. Why do we not leave somebody up front, at least one person, then they've got to have two players at the back? But Paul, before you answer, can I ask you to keep it quick because I want to get as many questions in as possible. Okay, okay very quickly keep then. Quick. Um, uh, statistically, uh, if you leave a player up top, you've got more chance of conceding than you have scoring. Uh, fact. Uh, and in fairness, everybody has a role at our club on corners. And the best teams in the world, Man City, Real Madrid, Barcelona, Liverpool, all take everyone back. Uh, and we have three zones, uh, the three people who can edit. Uh, and then we have a team of non-heading footballers, right? So their job is to get in and around people's feet. Now, you could argue, if we send two Smurfs up front who can't head it, and they send three back, right, 
they will probably, because it's League One especially, probably have people who are very good who can go and head it. If there's more room to move, so if I now try to win a header in this group here, seriously, it would be difficult, wouldn't it? Because there's loads of people. If I tried just me and Steve and you put a cross in, I'd smash him up. So uh, it's about the fact that it makes it difficult for the opposition. And like I said, statistically, the chances you score off a counter-attack are so slim. And the reason I laughed at him is because when I used to do these fans forum at my previous club, the bloke, that, a gentleman asked me this every single fans forum, and every single game he would boo me on every set piece going, <laughs> Leave two up, Warney. I've told you, leave two up. And every fan's form, he'd put his hand up and think, here we go, here we go. <laughs> so that's why my answer is so polished, but that is the truth, that is the truth. And he's here tonight. No, he's not here. Um, we'll get two more questions in. Um, we'll start here. Uh, yeah, hi, question for Stephen. Um, last year, we lost 10.6 million in the accounts. Um, and that, well, the question is, was that all down to takeover costs and outstanding debts from before, or are we expecting a similar loss again for this financial year? Um, and is, if it is, is that sustainable? And can the club continue to do that with David Clough's support? Or are we going to have to reduce that going forward? So I think... Oh, sorry, there you are. I was looking around. See, it's only when Owen stood up. Sorry. Um, so in terms of the losses, um, as I mentioned earlier on, Derby County in League One is not a cheap operation um, mi mixed in with that the league uh, the category one academy um, in terms of where the losses uh, will up op the operating losses moving forwards they're probably not going to shift massively in league one um, however we have built that into our five-year business plan that is fully funded and fully costed and, and signed off by, by David as, uh, as the owner. Um, but obviously, we will want to make sure that moving forwards, there is potential of player trading for reinvestment. But that doesn't mean that the money that we've agreed to go in in terms of, of uh, pushing us forward changes. Um, so it's just how we spend that and how we do that sensibly. Um, but to answer your question, look, in League One, you know, it, it, it is difficult to, to trim the operating cost of, of this football club. Yes, there were some legacy items in there, but not a huge amount because that was all within the, um, as you'll have seen, within the purchase um, price of the, of the football club um, and everything was cleaned up pretty pretty quickly thereafter. Hence why the Football League relaxed their um, stance and their, um, uh, I suppose, restrictions that we talked about for one season rather than two. Um, because the, the, when David came in, he made sure that everybody was paid <coughs> correctly, swiftly, um, and um, in some areas m more than needed to. So, look, it, to give everybody that um, that comfort moving forwards, it is all fully costed, it is all fully funded. Um, there is no debt in the football club, and I guess just to end it on uh, as well on that point um, of this question, the whole point of us wanting to have a supporters board is so that we can have these more open and transparent discussions. So the plan is at the moment you'll have seen that we've gone out to advert um, for the. Um, independent um, board members um, for which there's been I believe around 58 applications so far um, again to make sure that everybody's clear the panel for choosing who those independents will be on the board um, will be a panel of three of which the football club will get one seat the football supporters association um, will have one and then the Football Supporters Association will help to um, put a third person on there that is nothing to do with Derby County or even potentially the city of Derby. So it is completely independent and um, to, to look at those applications. And then once that is appointed, we're hoping sort of July time that we've got that supporters board in place and then we can then be starting to share with them the high level. Obviously, we can't give detailed, these are the, 
squad plans, etc. But in terms of this is our overall high level budget, this is how we're, it needs to be funded, this is what we're looking at in terms of moving forward so that there is complete transparency. And I think it's important to note as well that the FSA who have come out today, the Football Sports Association, um, backing the government bill, have even said and gone on record that what we're doing and planning to do here at Derby County is effectively the gold standard of what they'd love at every football club. So we genuinely are trying to make sure that people can see that whole transparency of this is the, the trajectory of the football club, these are the, the high level finances, allow them to challenge and, and, and check and give people the comfort that this football club is in good hands, but hopefully you know that anyway with David. Uh, Paul's decided he's in enough trouble already, so we're going to carry on until nine o'clock, yeah. aren't we? Okay. How so... do you like your beans, though? Because <laughs> that was the... How, and, and, how do you like your beans? Ramekin or no? I don't mind. As long as it comes with the rest of the full English, I'm not bothered. Which we don't get at the training ground, by the way. Not enough care. <laughs> not enough We'll care. get a couple more questions in. Any breakfast questions, welcome. I've got a question for Paul. So... You've averaged over two points a game when you've worn your bubble hats on the touchline <laughs> and under two points a game when you haven't. So can I ask you to leave your hat on until the job's done? That is absolutely fine. Is that true? Don't pretty sure me, because I'll get... <laughs> I'll get me analyst on it, and if that is... Uh, I, had, I mean, in fairness, I hardly ever take it off, so I can't... I didn't... I definitely wore it shrews. It was freezing. I find it weird when you're not wearing a hat. I feel naked if I don't wear a hat. I know, it's weird, isn't it? And I definitely wore it at uh, Stevenage. I remember pulling it over my eyes. <laughs> so, um, okay, I'll research that, but thank you. I will definitely try and uh, wear it. Time for a few more questions now. I'll come this, in fact, I'll come this way as I'm going past. Oh, we're going to finish first or second, Paul. Ooh. <laughs> no pressure. Good question, good question. Well, obviously, I would, uh, I would love to take either, and I'm not being... Uh, I mean, our job is to try and keep the lads' feet on the floor, as you well know, because if they think they've got it sussed, then they won't. They get punched in the face and lose three on the spin. So uh, I think our job has always been, although you know, I don't audibly say this every time I do a Radio Derby interview or something, but our job is always to try and go for the title. We've been saying it to the lads for weeks and months, so that has always been our dream to go for the title. And if you, you aim high and you fall short, then... I would definitely take second, but um, we are, you know, actively trying to hunt down the top team. And I think I know this because my stat man done this. I got my uh, analyst to give me stats today and I sent them to you, didn't I? I said, if it turns ugly, I'm going to start pulling stats out. Uh, and one of the stats was since we lost to Shrewsbury, we have, uh, I think we've won the most points in the league, but we've won nine more than... Pompey, but Pompey just had that really good start. I think they won nine out of ten. So ideally, and this is ideal, and this um, hopefully this isn't written down by a journalist because in print it would look awful. But if we were fortunate enough to win at the weekend and we did go two points by Iron Portsmouth and we do play them soon, and I know what it's like when you're at the top. It, it's weird between being hunter and hunted. So our, our dream is obviously uh, to go after the title, but. As you well know, who knows, could end up ninth, which would be a disaster. That's why we've done this tonight, because it feels, <laughs> it feels a nice time to do it. But, um, yeah, so we're definitely, we're definitely trying to... That's what we're trying to do, obviously, because I want everyone to have the best life they can have, and being the champions, it doesn't get any better. The next question, we are over here. Ooh, so you can see nice us. in the back. It's like Ant and Deck now. <laughs> Paul, if money was no object... Ooh. Brilliant question. Hair first, no. then teeth. <laughs> Would you, would you rather sign Jude Bellingham, Harry Kane, or Kylian Mbappe? Uh, I mean, I know because uh, Hammy always tells me there's some sort of rivalry between Derby and Birmingham over Jude and Louis. Is that right? <laughs> it seems a bit absurd. I've I got a funny feeling, respecting Louis, that Jude might be just nicking it at the moment. Uh, I would take, I would definitely take Jude Bellingham for me. He's at a good age, he can do every position. He could probably play in goal if he went down to 10 men. So without a shadow of a doubt, I would take him. Uh, next question, we've got time for a few more. We'll it's good, first. this fast bit's good. There's no really long ones about financial, oh. 
But um, yes. unlike some of our other managers, so far you seem to be like relatively like a normal bloke and you seem to have kept your personality, <laughs> uh, which is really appreciated, I think, by a lot of our fans. OK, thank you. I'm How not that normal, but yeah. been able to do that? Have you felt any difference in sort of pressure from Rotherham to here? And how have you been able to do that? Because it's not something anyone else has managed. Yeah, OK, yeah, thanks. Um, I think because uh, I, I appreciate I'm a bit quirky and... Um, uh, Oh, I don't know how to word it. Like, so I, I went into football management. I always want to be a PE teacher, right? So I didn't turn pro till I was 22. I went down that route. Uh, I always want to be a teacher. That's what I love to do. I did my degree early in life. Then I was fortunate enough to turn pro. Then I did a teaching degree when I was in my late 20s, early 30s. So when my football career ended at 39, I went into the fitnessy bit. Then I went into management, which I didn't want to do. I turned down the job numerous times. It is horrific, by the way. It still is. I'm not pretending anything other. It's a horrendous job. I spoke to two managers today. Both their teams are doing amazingly well, saying how hard it is now. It's getting more brutal, less fun in it. More people have got opinions on you. It's just, it's tough. Um, and, I, and I embraced the job I did, and I thought, look, if I'm going to do it, I'm just going to do it the way I want to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to get media trained or, like, be stiff, or this is just who I am. So if nothing else, I'm authentic. Yeah, I appreciate I'm Marmite. So, like, I don't know, 50% of the fan base will think I'm an absolute whopper. But at least, at least I'm always the same. So... In fairness to your question, it's quite a nice question. I am a really authentic guy, I think. I'm really sincere. I surround myself with really good people. Like, um, I love working for Steve and I love working for David. They're really good people. My staff I brought in are really good people. We've been brought in, surrounded by amazing people. Uh, and I've tried to bring great footballers, or as best we could, footballers to the club, but who are good people. And hopefully, as time goes by, if you know, I don't get sacked tomorrow, the more interviews you see with players and you see with the staff and the more behind the scenes stuff you see with Rams TV, you might, you know, hopefully you'll see more of it because that is how I think, I, I can't bear straight bat answers. I mean, every now and again, I send Richie out to do Radio Derby just so they appreciate my answers <laughs> because he is, um, he's true Yorkshire and he's boycott straight back down the wicket. So, uh, yeah, so anyway, I don't know if that's the answer you were looking for, but that, that's sort of who I am, so. I, I, look, and I, I want to come in as well and say, oh, yes. beans. <laughs> beans. from Paul's perspective, look, I know, I know, like you just said, in terms of some people may think you're Marmite or, you know, not as the case may be, but genuinely behind that sort of jovial facade that a lot of you... He's a killer. <laughs> he's, got, he's got pretty high standards, and that's, but I think the fact of, and what we've seen, and I, you know, I, I'm lucky enough to have seen some of the messages in terms that go between the players and Paul and how they, how they interact with each other and the, the support that he's got and how he's, he's got them behind what we want them to achieve and what Paul wants to get them to do. He's clearly very, very highly respected and the culture that's been created in terms of at the, at the training ground and the way that he brings everybody on, it, it's just been breath of fresh air it's just like ne something that we've never experienced before and I think it just permeates through the whole of the football club but that makes it a lot easier during the harder times as well because we've you know football clubs have ups and downs in a season and I think that's why I know you brought up in terms of the Stevenage point of view and you said you pulled your cap over your eyes but from us as a football club we were never you know as close together as we were then and we knew that it was all all fine and we stick to the plan and uh, you know, there is that support mechanism there for everybody. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a pleasure. Oh, thanks. <laughs> We've got time for one more question. So it's whoever catches my eye first, and it's this gentleman here. No, 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 egg or post no, eggs. no Ooh, pressure, all right? Decision. No pressure. Paul, a question for you. Yep. Who would be your vote for player of the season? Oh, good one. It's a good one. I mean, I might have a little show of hands here. There's a few, there's a few candidates, to be honest. Um, cool. it's, it's, it's so, I could talk about this for hours, literally, right? Because you sort of forget early season. You do. So when we talk about player of the season, if I mention a player now, and I'll mention a couple in a minute, uh, you think, mm, he wasn't very good at the weekend. But it's like they've played 30-odd games. Uh, a few uh, have been really good for me. Uh, and... At the moment, I am swaying to uh, Curtis Nelson. Yeah. 
Oh, thank you very much. You lot can come again. Anyone not clapping, get yourselves off. Get yourselves out of here. So I'd go Curtis Nelson. I think Cash has been uh, amazing. And in fairness to them two, I don't know if you've noticed, but we've had a few injuries this year. Uh, touch wood, uh, those two have been uh, pretty magnificent doing whatever they have to do. And uh, the funniest thing was, I don't know if I can tell you this, can I? This doesn't have to go out, does it? They can yeah. be unedited bits, does it? Oh, OK. Uh, one of our players the other day at half-time was getting checked out by the doctor, and Curtis went, leave him, doc, leave him. And he went, no, no, I need to assess him and all that. And he went, no, leave him, because if you assess him, you say he's not fit to play, and he'll have to just let him go back out again. <laughs> so in fairness to Curtis, he's a, a really good player, a really good leader, a, an amazing human, and without a T-shirt on, the most attractive man you'll ever see. He is... <laughs> There's no dispute that he's a machine. He, if you ever watch the warm-up before, and I know, like, if you ever come in early, our warm-up's always the same, right? Religious, right? And I always try and tap Nels, and I like to tap him on the stomach. And if I tap some players on the stomach, it can go... <laughs> but if you, touch, if you touch him, he's like, um, are you not entertained, gladiator? So, yeah, I think Nels... Uh, has been right up there. I'm just trying to think of, yeah, I, I think he's probably uh, my favourite. Although, you know, unfortunately, Birdie's injured at the moment. Birdie has been really good as well. Um, but Cash as well. I love Cash. Although, Cash has the... Uh, I, the, the, I, if I, if I, went to, I mean, in fairness, if you now met me in the booze and said, look, just talk to me about the players, I'd be there for hours, right? Uh, however, there's a real dearth of ability at this football club to take throw-ins. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else has noticed... But, like, like, Cash is a strong kid. If he throws it, he can't reach you where you are. <laughs> like, so... Whereas Nels has got an unbelievable one, but you can't stop him from using it. So I don't know if you ever noticed when we have, like, long throw-ins in the corner, and I'm going, Nels, no, no. It's like talking to a child. Just throw it short and get it back, but he just wants to throw it in. But the sad thing is, when uh, Sonny wasn't in the team, it's just him and Cash... He needs to throw it, but he needs to be on the end of it. <laughs> so he's literally throwing it to my five foot ten centre half in League One. He's never going to win it and score it and everything. So, yeah, so Curtis Nelson, uh, what, what would be your choice, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, between Nelson and Mendes. Yeah, you see, I forgot about Mendes. Uh, <laughs> in fairness, in fairness, like, it's always the people at the top in it. Always the sexy ones who do the step-overs. I like the sort of, the, the grit. The grit win your promotions and that. So Nat's amazing, and he has been the amazing. Because in fairness, the Buffalo's been great, yeah. Wilson's ledge. He's like my uh, come-from-nowhere player of the year. He's been brilliant. But um, Nat's an amazing player. Always been an amazing talent. The best thing about Nat is, and it's not easy to, to play for me, I know. I do demand a lot out of him emotionally. He's right. I do text him and pest him all the time. But... Um, I, I, I can't bear players that are good on the ball but then can't try a leg out of possession. I'm not saying Nat is that player, but when we first come in, he wasn't physically robust enough to do it. And I feel like, like this season, Touchwood, he's been amazing. His work rate off the ball has been really good. Uh, and going forward, yeah, he's, a, he's an unbelievable threat. And hopefully, uh, with the weeks coming up, you'll see more and more of Corey Blackett-Taylor as well to supplement what Nat does. So... Uh, yeah, Nat has been good. But I feel like Nat's gone through life being told he's great. Curtis has got a... Not a face, because he's a pretty boy, isn't he? But sort of like centre-halves never get told they're the best player, I think. So I, th I think Curtis, but if Nat asks me tomorrow, it's Nat. Uh, we have gone over. Um, thank you to the guys uh, for staying a little bit longer than advertised. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. I hope you've enjoyed the evening. Uh, let's hear it for all our guests, but particularly Stephen Pearce and Paul Warren. Thank you very much.